collection of books. And Voltaire, he set out to destroy the Bible with his pen. Put an end to all of this myth of this resurrection of Jesus and that he was the Son of God. And uh, after he died, this is his home in France, Parlez-vous Francais, and um, the Geneva Bible Society bought that house and printed Bibles out of it. <laughs> Has it got a sense of humor? God's word is like a great anvil. And you imagine a, a great, thick, big steel anvil and the critics and the communists, the socialists, the Nazis, the atheists, the hedonists, they all come and they, they slammed the anvil with their hammers. Century after century, pounding and pounding and pounding. And there at the bottom of the anvil, you will find all the broken hammers and the anvil still stands strong. Today, there are millions of copies that are printed, sold, and given away every year. The Bible is available all or in part by in 2,426 languages covering 95% of the world's population. Over 5 billion Bibles have been sold or printed and given away over the last uh, few hundred years. There are uh, about 100 million copies of the Bible sold and given away a year. And annual Bible sales in the United States is $425 million, $650 million uh, globally. And the Gideons give away a Bible every second. It is a, a, a truly enduring book. The fourth is the Bible is illuminating. Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It illuminates, it enlightens our understanding. It gives us the answers, those, those deep answers to, to life. Read, read this to you. No question is too big uh, and no answer is too small. At some point in time, every person grapples with life's most profound mysteries. Mm. And Jesus-centered uh, Bible tackles humanity's biggest questions with the kind of answers that only Jesus can provide. And look at these questions, because we've all been haunted by these questions. What's my purpose in life? Is God real? Why do bad things happen? What is the meaning of life? Is this all there is? Will everything be okay? What is truth? What is love? What is right and wrong? Read the poets. Read, read, the, read the singers. Read the rap singers. Read the modern singers of today. You find these questions. They're constantly being reiterated in people's songs. What is, what is my purpose? What is the meaning? Is there anyone up there? Is, where did I come from? Where am I going? Who am I? What am I? You know, so this, the Bible is not the missing piece to the puzzle. The Bible is the puzzle. If you really understand that. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I came to the Lord, I was looking for the piece, that missing piece to the puzzle, and suddenly I realized I had a bunch of wrong pieces. I needed a whole new puzzle. The fifth, the Bible is effective. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I, I sent it. But it shall accomplish what I please. The gospel, the Bible, the scriptures, they accomplish the very goals of God, which is what? To save people, to transform people, to conform people to the image of his Son. To reform us and revive us and renew us. The purposes of the scripture. Listen to what some, some of, of the great leaders in these last years said about the Bible. It is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God in the Bible, George Washington. If you understand our Constitution, you understand that, that it was built upon the premise that if people were truly centered in the scriptures, that they would be very easy to govern. When a person is centered in the scriptures, they will govern themselves. When they break away from the scriptures, and that's what's happened in our country, why are our prisons so filled with people? Why is there such lawlessness in our country? Because we've abandoned the very premise of what this foundation was built upon. Noah Webster, and you all use his dictionary at times, the Bible must be considered as the great source of all truth by which men are to be guided in government as well as in social transactions. Mahatma Gandhi. He said, if Christians would really live according to the teachings of Christ as found in the Bible, all of India would be Christian today. Mm. Abraham Lincoln, he said, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All the good of the Savior of the world is communicated to us through the book, but for it, uh, we could not know right from wrong. 
Look at our time and how we're wandering. And we've, we've wandered into this, this existential relativism where I mean, nobody knows what's right, nobody knows what's wrong anymore. It's like whatever you want it to be. By the way, anybody realize this? With, when it comes to truth, absolute truth, once you abandon absolute truth, you just make it up as you go along. Now, people, people will say, well, you know, well, well, people in their hearts, they know right from wrong, but when they wander, their hearts become seared, their, their hearts become hard, and then they can wander into all kinds of crazy, crazy, evil things. You know, there, there are people on earth that believe in loving their neighbor, and there are still people on earth that believe in eating their neighbor. Think about that. Many of us today, we find it appalling of the thought of a grown adult having sex with a little child. But that was commonplace in the Greek and Roman culture. We find it appalling the thought of taking a child and sacrificing it to an idol, but yet that's something that was practiced for thousands. Once, once people move away from the Bible, people will do whatever they see they want to do in their own eyes. You have anarchy, and that's where we are today in this country. We've abandoned the very foundation. Abraham Lincoln is correct with that. Martin Luther King said, I have felt like Jeremiah, the word of God is in my heart like burning fire shut up in my bones. It's a good place to have the word of God. Ronald Reagan said, within the covers of the Bible are the answers for all the problems men face. Teddy Roosevelt, he said, a thorough knowledge of the Bible is worth more than a college education. I think that's true. Yep. The sixth is the Bible is complete. The word of God tells us, and the book of the Revelation ends, the scriptures end with this, this strong, Word from the Lord, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. So there's a strong warning of adding or subtracting to the Bible, that the Bible is, uh, it is complete. You know, Len, when he talks about uh, you know, this program that we're going to be doing here about being able to identify heresy and cults, something that's very alarming to me is I, as I read contemporary Christian books by many of the popular preachers and teachers, I'm not talking about cult leaders, the people that you see in a lot of the, the internet uh, sites, the people on YouTube, how many things they teach that are truly heretical, heresy, false teachings, leading people astray. They teach a lot of New Age teachings, and there's a lot of teachings that they teach are just nothing more than, than some fancy self-help messages, but not truly the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to know the Bible, and when we know the Bible, we can quickly identify counterfeits. There was a, a man years ago, he, he worked at the, uh, at the uh, treasury as a mint, and he would basically... Uh, Bills would come down in those sheets, and he would basically feel them, and he would just simply you know, take them, and he would put them into a pile. And they thought they'd play a trick on him one day, so they basically put a counterfeit page of false bills that was printed on, on a paper that's not the actual paper that our, our dollars are, are printed on. And as soon as he touched it, he knew that it was a counterfeit. And they asked him, you know, how did you know that? And he said, when you know the original, it's so easy to identify a counterfeit. Now, I've studied the cults, and I've studied world religions, and I've studied comparative religions, and I, study, like, I, spent, I spent a long period of time in my life just, just studying Kingdom of the Cult by Walter Martin and understanding what the Jehovah Witnesses believe that's in contradiction to what we believe, or what the Mormons believe in contradiction to what we believe, or Christian science, or, or unity, or some of these other, other cults. And the one thing I can tell you, you can spend a lot of time doing that. And coming to the seminar is a, is a really good thing for you. But I'll say this to you. When you know the original, you will quickly know a counterfeit. Facts. When you know this book, people say, well, you need to read this, you need to read that. I'm telling you, the older I'm getting, the book I want to read most is this book. I want to know it more. When you know this book, it's easy to identify a counterfeit when it's been presented to you. The seventh, the Bible is authoritative. Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. The word there, settled, is, is natsab. In the Hebrew, it means uh, established. It stands unmovable. It is eternal. It is established. It never fades away. This universe will fade away. You read scientists today, and scientists say, you know, the universe had a beginning. The universe is going to have an end. 
you know, the laws, you know, the, you look at the law of you know, innovation, energy is running out. The universe is running out of gas, and one day it will just simply dissolve. That's exactly what the scripture said. But his word will, will never fade away. And this book, it is not filled with suggestions. The Ten Commandments are not God's suggestions, his ten suggestions. The Ten Commandments is God's revelation to mankind. The Word of God is God's revelation to mankind. It's His divine decrees, commands, that are to be believed and obeyed. In, in your notes, you'll notice the front page, and I, I, I put this there, that I, I teach and preach the Word of God without apology and with authority. But understand what I'm saying here. I'm not standing here like some cult leader that I have some type of... Um, in, in, Internal authority. I have no authority. When, when, when the church begins to put men on pedestals, which we love to do, we are, we are, idol, we are idolaters of men. Facts. And people look at the Catholics and they say, look, they do with the Pope. Hey man, let me tell you something. Protestantism and evangelical Christianity and charismatic Christianity, they have more popes than, uh, than, than the Vatican has had in 2000, you know, in, in 1700 years. We put men on pedestals and we worship them. And then when they fail, people are so devastated. When they let us down, they're so devastated. They're just people. The authority that I stand here with you and, and speak to you with, you know, we get with is the authority of Scripture. And once I deviate from Scripture, I'm a fool. <laughs> so it's the, it's the authority in the Word of God. That's the authority. The, script, the scriptures are an authority. It's the word of the Lord. The eighth is, the Bible is determinative. In John 8, 47, he who is of God, okay, the person who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, he says to the Pharisees, you do not hear because you are not of God. Do you understand what I'm saying there? Mm. That essentially... You will know people who are saved by whether they hear, they not just simply, he's not talking about the words coming in here, he's talking about people taking it in, understanding it, obeying it. That you will know who the true Christian is by how they receive the word of God. Whether they, they receive it and understand it. In fact, the single most determining factor as to whether a person is saved or not the single most determining factor that determines whether a person is truly born of the Spirit or not is whether they understand the Word or not. That's what Jesus is saying there. And it's repeated in a number of other places in Scripture, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2.14. But the natural man, this is the man who is not born again. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they have foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And that was true of me before I was born again. I didn't think that the, the Word of God was total fun. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to be in a church listening to it. I don't want to be bothered with it. And the man who was influential in leading me to Christ, one day he came to a church picnic that we were at, and he pulled out his Bible and he said, I would like to read some scripture to you. Oh, I remember that day. He read the scriptures. You know what? Let me tell you, when I hear the scriptures, I remember things. I don't remember anything he read that day. In fact, I didn't hear a word that he said as he was reading from, I know he said he was reading from a psalm. I don't know what psalm he was reading from. I don't know anything that he said. Why? Because I was not born of the Spirit. It determines. The scripture determines. And it's a great reveal. So you're sitting here and you're saying, I come to church every Sunday. I ain't getting anything. Let me tell you something. That's not my problem. That's your problem. And that's a big problem. You've got a big problem that you need to resolve. And you need to come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because going to church ain't going to get you to heaven. Remember, going to church don't make you any more of a Christian than going to McDonald's will make you a hammer. <laughs> I wish I said it. Keith, maybe Keith me said that. A.W. Tozer is one of my teachers. Listen to what he says. He says, the Bible is not addressed to just anybody. Its message is directed to a chosen few. You understand that? It's not addressed 
to just anybody. It's addressed to a chosen few. He says, as the pillar of fire gave light to Israel, right? Remember the pillar of fire? That led Israel. It says, uh, the cloud of darkness was given to the Egyptians, right? It blinded them. So our Lord's words shine in the hearts of his people, but leave the self-confident unbeliever in uh, the obscurity of moral night. Just like I said, the, when I was an unbeliever, it was, just, it was just darkness when that passage was being read. The child who has been born again, the child, we're all children of God who have been born again, but I'm talking about the little kids upstairs. In fact, we were in a Bible study a couple weeks ago, and um, what is your daughter's name? Carmela. Carmela. How old is Carmela? Seven? What is it? Carmela. 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 Okay, so Carmela, seven, seven year old kid, we're in adult Bible study. This is at Faith and Contact. And I'm teaching about, I'm teaching about when God lifts the curtain. And suddenly we get a vision into the heavenly realms. And when God lifted the uh, curtain for Elisha, remember, and they saw the angels surrounding them, protecting them. When God lifted the curtain for Daniel, Daniel suddenly sees that there are angels and they're battling. There's a spiritual battle going on as he's praying. That little girl starts sharing things. Let me tell you something. The PhDs who don't know him wouldn't have a clue. You ever, you, ever talk to, you ever talk to PhDs who don't know the Lord? They, it's like, it's like you're, you're talking to a little child. I mean, they could be brilliant in other things. They may, they may be a brilliant chemist or a physicist. They're totally ignorant of the scriptures. And, and that, is, that is because the person without the spirit cannot grasp these things. The Bible determines. It's a great revealer of whether the person is truly saved or not. Number nine, uh, the Bible is infallible. Psalm 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now, let me share this with you. This is important. You need to listen to this for a few minutes. Really tune in. The Bible is infallible. Uh, understand this. You have what are called the autographs. Okay, those are essentially, the autograph is a manuscript penned by the author himself. Okay, so the autographs, Moses penned Torah. Okay, he, he penned Genesis and uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And Paul penned the epistles. John penned the book of the Revelation. John penned his gospel. Matthew penned his gospel. Samuel penned 1 Samuel. Okay, we, we, we have, and they penned those words. So the autographs that were penned by the authors themselves, we have zero autographs of any Bible book. I don't know if you know that. They, they've never been found. The original autographs. I believe there's a reason for that. Could you imagine if they were found? They would be worshipped. If the Catholic Church got their hands on them, let me tell you something, they would be set them up and people would be coming in and touching them. And they, they have a, a statue in Rome of Peter that um, they kissed his toe off. <laughs> the toe is gone. 1,500 years of kissing the toe, it's gone. And they looked that kissed it, took a little grain of, uh, of cement with them. <laughs> Why do you think God hasn't revealed the Ark of the Covenant? Could you imagine? But Jews or, or Christians got their hands on that and become an idol. So the autographs are, they're, they're, they're hidden. So instead we have thousands of copies, fragments, or versions. Hmm. Textual criticism is the field of study that assesses the body of evidence to discover the most authentic text of the uh, text of the scriptures. I want it. I have become a textual critic in the last years. I, I really started to just, you know, the Bible says what it is, but I really wanted to see and I wanted to understand the text. So here's something. Here's something very interesting. Manuscript evidence for ancient writing. So Julius Caesar, okay, who lived, um, okay, it was written about Caesar 100 to 44 B.C. Okay, he's looking here about 100 years before uh, Jesus, or 60 years before Jesus. And the earliest fragments, okay, that were found, were found in 900 A.D. So that's a thousand years from Julius Caesar. There have been ten manuscripts found in that period. But we don't have any problem believing Julius Caesar, right? We know, we look at him as a historical character. Plato, 427 to 347, uh, in A.D. 900, they find seven manuscripts of Plato. 
don't have any problem believing that Plato wrote it and, and Plato lived. By the way, you said some of these other peoples here, Tychidus, uh, Suetonius, but look at the New Testament. The New Testament was written between AD 40 and AD 100. The earliest uh, fragments and copies were found in 125, mm -hmm. um, just 25 to 50 years after they were written, and there are over 24,000 copies and fragments. There's, there's over 5,700 copies of the New Testament that have been found. Now again, they're, they're not the original autographs. Mm. So one of the arguments that the skeptics that skeptics make is, well, you know, you know how it is that when you you, you know you're writing you know, the original and they copied the original and then this guy copied the original. I understand why that was happening because they have printing presses and uh, the paper would wear out. The papyrus paper would wear. I, I have books up in my office that are 500 years old. I'm afraid to open them because when I open them, a lot of the pages would turn to dust. I have a Bible upstairs that's 500 years old. It goes, it goes back. It's like it's like back from the 1500 King James period. And people say, God, I don't know how much money that's worth. So, so people, some people may go upstairs and say, yeah, I need, I need to get some money for my drug. Don't look at that title. Good luck finding it. I'll say, good luck. Be careful it doesn't blow up on you, right? So, this person copies it, and then this person copies it. And then by the time you get, you know, you get 10, 15, 20, 30 copies, imagine what happens, right? You have distortions, right? 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 Yeah. Listen to what God did prevent that. So the scribes, we always kind of hey, we talk bad about the scribes in the Gospels. The scribes, though, had an incredible responsibility, and their responsibility was to copy the scrolls. So you have scribes copying the scrolls from the Old Testament, you have scribes copying the, uh, the, the, the New Testament. So when a scribe would, would copy, let's say he's copying the, the scroll of Isaiah, he would be copying it, and over his shoulder would be uh, a supervisor, and he'd be watching him copying it. And if he made one mistake, if there was one letter that wasn't wasn't correctly right written, if there was one dot missing or one tittle, that's that's a that's a cross of a T and a dot of an I. They take the scroll, they burn it, and you got to start over again. At the end of writing the entire scroll, they would count every letter. And every word, and if there was one letter or one word off, you burn it. Now I want you to imagine this. You're a scribe, and you get all the way to Isaiah 66. And you make a mistake. Well, what are you what are you gonna what are you gonna say when you make that mistake, right? It's gonna it's gonna be you're gonna say something, right? It's gonna be you're gonna hear, I mean it's gonna it's gonna be some something there. Right? <laughs> Isn't that a great though foolproof way to protect the scriptures? So watch this. How do we know the Bible is reliable? The significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There were these scrolls that were found in 1947 in a cave called Qumran. So when we go to Israel, we've been to Israel seven times. So I take people up to the cave of Qumran, and there's this kid, this shepherd boy, and he threw some rocks in the cave to scare his sheep out. He wanted to take them home, and he hit this jar, and inside. Uh, when they would later go up and, and, and find, they found a scroll from the book of Isaiah, okay, that dated 125 B.C. Hmm. The most recent one they had was dated 916 A.D. What you understand is that's a difference of 1,042 years. 1,042 years separation between the finding of these two scrolls. They investigated and they examined the scrolls to see if there was any difference between these two scrolls of what, 1100 years, well, 1050 years, and um, this is what they found, listen to this. The discovery of Dead Sea Scrolls was extremely reassuring. The Isaiah scroll from Cave 1, for example, is by far the most complete of the scrolls and was one of the first to be published word by word, verse by verse. It corresponds exactly to the text as we have it. Yeah. I want to tell you something. Uh, there was one little tittle. <laughs> and they think it might be a distortion in the paper, in the papyrus, but there was one little tittle that was off. One. So when people come up to you and say, how can you touch your Bibles? Because they've been transferred all over and all. Just, you got the answer. You don't know what you want. By the way, most people, they don't know what they're talking about. So wait, if you don't know what you're talking about, shut up. You just sound stupid. 
And people come to me and they give me these arguments, and I'm just looking at them and going, man, you know, you should just be quiet. You sound dumb. You, you know, you don't know what. I, I when people come to me, they're like, well, I've read the Bible and I know the Bible, and I, I would say to them, well, then what about what it says in Hezekiah chapter seven fourteen? Well, yeah, I, I, I know. Well, there's no such thing as Hezekiah chapter seven fourteen. <laughs> I'm with people at times who are brilliant, I'm with brilliant people, brilliant people, di- you know, different fields, different, you know, different. Like, and when they're talking, I know nothing about their. They know nothing about their. Field. I just want to be quiet and sit there. I try to think of just, just an intelligent question to ask, because anything else I say, I'm just going to look like a dummy. Now let me share. I want to share something with you here for for a minute. We use the New King James Version here at Living Word Community Church. Okay. There, there are, uh, there's essentially uh, two streams here uh, that, that flow, the Byzantinian tradition, the Alexandrian tradition, uh, the King James Version, New King James Version came through Textus Receptus. The Alexandrian tradition could produce the Nestle Alien tradition. By the way, NIV, NASB, um, all, in fact, almost every translation, if you're sitting here with a translation that's not King James or New King James, you're using one of these translations that came from, uh, from these folks. Now, let me just say this to you. The two influences of Nassau and Aylin that essentially took, they, they, they put um, the translation, they, they interpreted the Greek, and, and that's what the NISB and NIV was uh, translated from, were uh, two uh, Anglican, uh, they were Anglican churchmen named Westcott and Hort. And um, Westcott and Hort, by the way, despised Textus Receptus. They despised it. And uh, so they rejected it, and they, you know, they, they came up with their own uh, Greek uh, New Testament. And um, one thing interesting about uh, those two men, they were occultists. They, they practiced the cult. They, they were occult practices. And um, I don't believe that they were born again after reading much of, of their writings. So when they created that, there's a lot of things that are missing. I'll show you. Some of you are aware of uh, some of these just by reading your Bible. I want to compare these. Um, in, in Matthew chapter 14, uh, the modern version is he, the King James Version, says Jesus. And by the way, I, I think that's a big difference, don't you? I mean, he. Uh, I want to know that it's who, who, who he, right? Who he. In Acts chapter 19.10, it just says the Lord. And in uh, King James Version, it's the Lord Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 9, 1, it's Jesus, and in King James Version, it's Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah. In uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 18, again, Jesus Christ, Jesus uh, Messiah. In Acts chapter uh, 16, 21, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. And in 2 John 3, uh, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if that would make a difference to you, but I find that very important, that those words which are there should be there, right? Here, here's, a, here's an interesting one. Uh, this is, uh, how is this for conspiracy? The NASB in 1 John 3.21, see how great the love of the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. But look at the King James Version, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. Now you may be sitting there and say, what's the difference between a child of God and a son of God? It's a huge difference in Scripture because universally all creation, all people are children of God. But you are a son of God when you have been born again and born into the family of God and adopted into his family. That's a huge difference. By the way, what's interesting about that is Westcott and Hort were universalists and they did not believe that you had to be born again. They believed everybody was going to heaven. Boy, is that a teaching from the devil. Here's, a, here's, a, here's another, another big one. Colossians 1.14, King James Version, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And then the NIV, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Do you understand that difference? What's the difference? The blood. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins by whom? By what? By the blood of the Lord, the death of the Lord. He hung on that cross six hours that Friday and he took our sins upon himself. That's, that's a little scary to me. And then in, in Mark chapter 19, uh, 9 through 20, how many of you find this in your NIV? In your NASB? The earliest manuscripts of some of their ancient witnesses do not have verse 9 through 20. Have you ever noticed that? Mm. People come to me all the time and say, well, Mark Chapel, you know, it wasn't there in the earliest versions. And I started questioning this because early in my Christian life, upstairs I have 
all the volumes that were written, it was about 15 years ago, everything that was written by the early church fathers, the first 300 years of Christianity. And I was reading through them, and I found in the writings of Irenaeus and Hippolytus, Mark chapter 6, 9 through 20. And uh, Irenaeus wrote in 150, that's only 50 years after the Bible was complete. And then Hippolytus wrote in the year 200. So, they're basically, that's what we call scholastic dishonesty, saying there have been no, there's no findings in the early Christian church of Mark chapter 16, 9 through 20, so we use this later version because it's more superior. But it's there. And I'll show you next week something amazing about Mark 16, 9 through 20. Remember when we've gone through and I shared with you about hepatic structures? Well, there's a hepatic structure in Mark chapter 9, uh, 16, 9 through 20, which uh, is something absolutely amazing. But simply what we look here is, and this, this is the key, there, this is a book that claims to be the Word of God. It claims to be the Word of God. And um, so I can stand in front of you and I can claim to be a poached egg. <laughs> Listen, I'm a poached egg. I've been poached and I'm an egg. I got a yolk, a shell, and what? It doesn't matter what I say. And I want to, I want to say this to you. It doesn't matter merely that the Bible says it's the Word of God. How do we know it's the Word of God? And uh, what I'm going to share with you, <coughs> and I'm going to start sharing it with you next week. I was hoping to get to some of these today. And uh, this an initial introduction to this series it was five minutes ago. I mean, five minutes when I started, and it turned into uh, 40 minutes and um, the first point that I'll make next week is prophecy and um, I'll give you a little highlight here for just a few minutes before I wrap up but we're going to look at 10 supernatural evidences that show us that the Bible has supernatural qualities supernatural elements <coughs> excuse me And what those uh, are going to be is we're going to look at prophecies. That's the future told in advance. That's 28% of the Bible. And uh, not only told in advance, but told with pure, undiluted accuracy. <coughs> so this isn't Nostradamus. You know, he hits one every once in a while. <coughs> it's not Gene Dixon, who um, predicted the death and the shooting of JFK. Did you know that? But she also predicted that World War III was going to happen in 1958 between us and China, and it didn't. She also predicted that this great man was going to show, uh, appear on the scene who was born in 1962. In 1999, he was going to suddenly come on the scene. He was going to unite all the world religions, and the world was going to become a wonderful place where we would all be singing Kumbaya, and that we would uh, burn our, our swords and our guns, and we would get along well. Fine, that didn't happen. And there's many other things that she predicted that never happened. So when the Bible predicts something, uh, it happens. 200, uh, 332 predictions about Jesus, the first coming. And every one of them he fulfilled. Made some of them 1,500 years, 1,000 years, 500 years before he walked the earth. So we're going to look next week at prophecy. Then we'll look at the main character. There's something very supernatural about the main character in the Bible. That it's not just Jesus who appears in the Gospels, but that Jesus is in every chapter, and I'll start to show you some of this in a little more detail. I've talked to you about how he's in every book, but Jesus is in every chapter of the Bible. The theme. 2,000 years, 40 authors, 66 books, and one continuous theme. What is the theme? The unraveling plan of redemption. The salvation of mankind, the theme flows right from Genesis, right to the book of the Revelation. As though there was just one author. The honesty of the Bible. You ever notice the honesty? There's, there's a supernatural honesty in the Bible that you will not find in any... You, think of, you ever read autobiographies of people? Read, read the autobiography of Bill Clinton. I just want to do that as homework this week. Because all the things that Bill, that we know he did, he doesn't talk about. By the way, you can go and do the same thing with Nixon. Read the autobiography of, of Richard Nixon. Oh, it's like he never sinned, never made a mistake. And the Bible is so 
incredibly honest. Right from the beginning, the, the, the two characters right in the beginning, what did they do? They screwed up this whole thing. And then one of their sons kills the other son. And then you look at Noah, and he looks really good. All I know is, right, what happened in, in chapter 9? He was naked doing something. All I'm saying is he's 600 years old. I don't want to know what a 600-year-old naked man is doing. <laughs> Just think of that. I don't. Thank you, Lord, for not telling me that. One of his sons looked at what well, I don't know what he's doing. I don't even want to presume it. We don't even want to think about what people are doing. Right? Evil stuff people are doing. Abraham, the father of the faithful. Let me tell you something. When we went, when we went through, and we studied Abraham here on Wednesday night, I couldn't believe how many times he was unfaithful. This is the father of the faithful. He's unfaithful already. He does some mean, nasty things. Jacob, who becomes Israel. Right? We, we've been, we're studying him right now. He's like the ultimate con man. And then the, the 12 sons of Jacob, who become, you know, they're, they're Israel. They're scoundrels. They're, I mean, they're just, there's just this incredible, and then you get to the New Testament, same thing. And the apostles who are writing it are just basically telling, hey, I'm just an idiot. I'm just, I'm just you know, I'm, I deny the Lord. I, I deserve the Lord. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. So we'll talk about the supernatural honesty. Then we'll talk about the, the author, the supernatural author. And then I want to talk to you about the integrated message system. That the Bible is an integrated message system. Most people that you know you need to understand this. Like you don't have in the Bible the book of the re- uh, of the resurrection. So if you want to, you know, it, it's not the book of the resurrection. You don't get the book of the resurrection, or or the book of the Holy Spirit, or the book of Satan. You have to study the scriptures and the revelations are like if you're studying and you want to know about Satan, you need to study Ezekiel 28, then you go to need to Isaiah chapter 14, then you go to Revelation chapter 12, you need to go to Genesis chapter 3, you need to go to Matthew chapter 4, you need to study many times his names are mentioned. You know, and he and, and he is the you know, he, he is our adversary, he is Satan, he is the devil, you know, he is Lucifer, he is Beals above. And you need to study the entire script, and it's integrated almost like if you've ever studied codes, like military codes, that they would use military codes during war. We still use military codes, and, and, and basically they are to essentially hide a message from the hostile forces. It's a strange thing that God has kind of given us this message, and the message is for those chosen few who somehow have this decoding ability. If you don't have the decoding ability, you're not going to get it. So we'll talk about it being an integrated message. And then we'll talk about heptatic structures. There's heptatic structures. Heptatic, hepta means seven. There were these seven structures. They're throughout the scripture. Notice the number seven keeps appearing over and over and over and over. You look at Revelation, seven trumpets, seven seals, right? Seven bulls, seven, 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 seven churches. But that's throughout the scriptures. And then there are these structures that are in the scriptures that when you look at... What I can tell you is the mathematicians who have looked at these structures, and they call it an anomaly, I've heard things like if you took 400 computer experts and put them on super IBM, you know, like like the big computers, the iframes, A-frames, if you put them on those computers, it would take 40,000 years for them to be able to do these structures that are in the scriptures. Like uh, it'll blow your mind if you've never seen it before, and I'll, I'll share that with you in upcoming weeks. The science in the Bible. You know, for, for years, and I'll share this with you for a few minutes. Everybody said, the earth is flat. The earth is flat. So when, well, you know, that goes, goes back to Ptolemy, Pato- 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 the earth is flat, and the sun and the planets and the moon go around the earth. And for 1,500 years, Ptolemy Pato- ruled until Galileo and Copernicus came along, and they said, no, the earth is not flat, it's round, and we're actually revolving around the sun, and the Roman Catholic Church put them in jail. Yes. Galileo said it very loudly, Copernicus was kind of quiet. Well, what does the Bible say? The Bible says the earth is round. And the Bible says that the earth travels around the sun. I don't know how many of you realize that. And people like, if it, there are things the Bible says that are contradicting modern day science. There's some things in science today. You know, the scientists today, they come to these theories, and you know, people just, and, and we do this. There's truth, and we don't want to give up on it. You know, we, we think it's the truth, and it, it, it's something that's false, but we have been convinced 
in our theological and our, in our Christian back that that is true and we won't give up. Well, that's what scientists do today. There are things that are clearly being shown uh, that the scientists now, so many of them are saying, this didn't come about by chance. There's so much principle in it. There's, there's all these scientific principles in it. And, and now many of them are saying that there has to be some type of, I mean, Einstein said it, a super being of power and intelligence that created this whole thing. But they'll just hold on. They want to hold on to their, to their evolutionary you know, atheism. They won't let it go. They won't let it go. They won't let it go. But again, Christians do that too with, with false beliefs. But we'll talk about science and the Bible. We'll talk about Bible codes and we'll talk about the ultimate purpose of the Bible. What is the ultimate purpose of the Bible? Salvation. Well, the ultimate purpose of the Bible is essentially the glory of God. But uh, God does that by bringing many sons to salvation to Jesus Christ. And uh, so him trying to save us. And not only save you, but conform you to the image of the Son. And ultimately to glorify you and bring you to a place where you are going to be so super. Not as super as him, but you will be so super duper. I just tell you, this life and what you'll experience in Jesus will not compare. It's, it's a token of what he has for you in the next life. Yeah. It's going to be so incredible. So I, I say this to you. If, if you haven't given your life to Christ, give your life to Christ. Come to him today. Open your heart and invite, invite Jesus to come into your heart to be your Lord and your Savior. Enter into this incredible adventure. Begin to, to get to know him through his word and enter into the adventure. I'll tell you, it's the adventure of adventures. You can travel around the world. You can go to Alaska and experience incredible things. You can, you can go and you can climb up you know, the Himalayas and experience great. Let me just tell you, you can have an adventure every day in this book. Meeting the Almighty God. Learning who He is, but learning who you are and the purpose He has for you. And that is a really exciting adventure. It's an exciting adventure. So would you all bow your heads and we'll close in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord God.